Thou shalt not commit adultery. No, I haven't cheated on my wife. Yeah, but have you ever lusted after Playboy penthouse, huh? Jesus said, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery with her already in your heart. Now, most people think that by their own assessment, they're pretty good. But God doesn't grade on a curve, and he's not going to grade you on your standard or my standard. He's going to judge your righteousness on his standard. And his standard is his son, Jesus Christ, who was perfect, who kept perfectly all of God's holy law. Come on, if you know that you know that you know. If it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, you would have been cut off a long time ago. Now, if you know that to be true, say thank you, Jesus. Come on, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Say praise God. Praise hallelujah. God. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. you so easy to love. You may be seated in his presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Certainly we give honor to God and to his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit. And certainly we thank God for our pastors, Pastor Jason and Pastor Asia, Pastor James and Evangelist Gail. Solomon, our youth director, and his lovely wife, Aaliyah. And to each of you, our father's children, as the pastor has said, this is a special day. We've been praying and we have asked each of you to invite people here today, people who have not yet placed their trust in Jesus. And I don't have a hidden agenda. I'm going to tell you what I'm up to before I even get started. It is my prayer and my hope that God will use me today to preach the gospel, the good news, so that anyone sitting in here unsaved, that you would open your heart and believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God has raised him from the dead, that you might be, listen, born again. Now, that's something that happened to me when I was uh, 19 years old. I was a student at UConn. I had grown up in the church, but I didn't know Jesus. I had one birthday, and one birthday folk can't understand the Bible. They think they do, but they, they don't. Jesus said, unless a man is born again of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Unless the man is born again of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And here's the funny thing about it. Most people want to know everything before they believe anything. But God got it fixed up. You're not going to know until you believe. Listen to what he said. Jesus said this. He said, except you humble yourself and become as a little child. You shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's so simple to get saved, but yet so difficult. Because people want to analyze. They want to figure out. They want to uh, 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 go through a, a lot of mental uh, gymnastics. When the only thing that God has asked them to do to get saved is believe. Believe that God loves you. Believe that you are a sinner. Believe that you can't save yourself. Believe that you can't do it on your own. And like a child, I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. I believe, Jesus, you are God's son. You died on the cross and rose from the dead to save me. That's what happened to me when I was 19. And I joined the two-birthday crowd. I'm standing up here with two birthdays. I was born on May 4th, 1956. I was born again on March 17th, 1975. This old dude up here is 66. 
But this other fella, this born again fella, the outer man perish, but what? But the inward man is renewed day by day. So please listen. If you're sitting in here with one birthday, li listen, listen closely. Hallelujah. <laughs> Our scripture today, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 7. Let's look at it together. <clears throat> now listen, this is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the church at Corinth. And by the way, these were some sinning saints at Corinth. They needed to grow. So Paul is talking to them and helping them to teach them to grow and live up to what they had become in Christ with their second birthday. He says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now here it is. But if our gospel, the good news, if our good news be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom, and here it is. The God of this world, hunt your neighbor, say, that's the devil. In whom the God of this world, lowercase g, what has he done? He has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Let us pray. Father, remove Douglas Keith Kears out of the way and let us all decrease that you might increase. Send your word, Lord, and let it fall into the good ground of believing and understanding hearts that it might bring forth the fruit of a new birth the fruit of the spirit which is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness and temperance which is self-control that it might bring forth the fruit of righteousness and the fruit of new converts that would be one as we share our faith have your way lord this morning Harvest souls today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now with God's help and with your prayers, I want to preach from this subject. Seven of the devil's favorite lies to keep you lost and confused. Now it's bad enough to be lost, but lost and confused. You're going to stay lost if you lost and confused. And it's the devil's job to make sure that you stay lost, to make sure you stay confused. I thank God for my lovely wife playing so beautiful. Thank you, honey. Amen. So now, what's the way out of this dilemma? I didn't come here to argue. I came here to preach. I already believe the Bible. You can believe it or not. You see, Ripley's not the first one who came up with. Leo 
it or not. <laughs> I believe old Ripley got tired arguing with folk. I saw a two-headed alligator. Ripley, you ain't seen no two-headed alligator. <laughs> believe it or not. Jesus came out with believe it or not long time before Ripley. This is Jesus' believe it or not after he rose from the dead. He told his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. That sounds like believe it or not to me. So now, you're not here so I can argue with you, debate with you, convince you, though I'm well qualified to do that. You are here to hear what thus says the Lord. I am one of God's preachers, one of God's messengers and I have the responsibility to warn the lost that if you don't get born again you will die and you will go to hell now that's not mean that's that's love because I know that there's a heaven I know that there's a hell and me preaching the gospel to you it's like a man who knows that the house is on fire, but the other folk don't know. I couldn't say that I love you and not warn you. The house is on fire. Get out of there. Escape. That's what I'm here for today. Oh, you trying to scare me? You trying to scare me into believing? I need to do something to get you to believe. And if it takes you being afraid of the reality and possibility of hell, so be it. Now, don't let your sophisticated mind fool you. Because you ain't going to figure this out. You have to believe first and know second. That requires, come on, somebody say it, faith. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what the Bible says? Because you, you and I don't have no excuse. The Bible says that God has given to every man the measure of faith. What does that mean? That means that no one who is saved has no more faith than anybody else. See, here's, here's, here's what happened. Adam sinned. Y'all know the story. Sin passed down to every single human being after him. We are all rotten apples. And uh, this is what God told me. He's given all of the rotten apples these things. Life. Time. Free will. Intellect. Volition. Free will. Jesus. Here's the question. Rotten apple. What are you going to do with Jesus so the rotten apple can be saved? Every rotten apple that hears the gospel and believes the gospel, Jesus saves them. But not just willy nilly saves them, he saves them on the basis of what he has done for them. And what did he do for them? He did for them what they could not do for themselves. He lived a perfect, holy, sinless life and fulfilled the moral law of God. We call it the Ten Commandments. Everybody in this room, including the one standing up here, is guilty of being a rebel and a lawbreaker against God, against his holy law. The Bible says that if you break one of God's Ten Commandments, you broke them all. Think about it like this. Think of not 
10 separate laws. Think of it as a vase. You can't break some of the vase. <laughs> if it cracked, you done messed up the whole thing. And that's how God judges. Now, everybody in this room, if you just take a little inventory, you know, I ain't going to ask you to name the Ten Commandments, you know. I'm not even going to ask you to name ten beers or ten football teams. Because <laughs> some of us might have a better chance doing that than naming the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so I'll just name a few, and you be honest. One of them is, you should not bear false witness. Lie. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody here ever lied? So what does that make you if you lied? Don't tell me about no white lie, big lie, this lie, that lie. <laughs> now you know bad English. You done lie. That makes you a liar. Have you ever stolen anything? Thou should not steal. It don't have to be something big. That ink pen that you took from work. <laughs> What does it make you? A thief. Now see, let me tell you what the problem is. We're so used to sinning until sinning ain't no big deal no more. We just sin all the time. Break God's laws all the time. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I don't think I have to spell it out. Thou shalt not commit adultery. No, I haven't cheated on my wife. Yeah, but have you ever lusted after Playboy penthouse hut? <laughs> Jesus said, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery with her already in your heart. Now, most people think that by their own assessment, they're pretty good. But God doesn't grade on a curve, and he's not going to grade you on your standard or my standard. He's going to judge your righteousness on his standard, and his standard is his son, Jesus Christ, who was perfect, who kept perfectly all of God's holy law. None of us who are honest can make that claim. We're guilty. Now the punishment for breaking God's holy law, as I already told you, is to die and go to hell, a place that God didn't make for you. He didn't make that for us. He made it for the devil and his angels. And see, a whole lot of people, you know, uh, they, they don't understand why God allows people to choose to go to hell. Because when they don't believe, that's what they're doing. They're choosing to go to hell. I'm going to tell you why. You see, God is love. And inherent in love is the notion of free will. Not coercion, but a choice based on facts. Let me show you what I mean. If God just made puppets and robots, so what? What, what is that? You don't know anything. You, you're just going along. You're a puppet. You're a robot. But the glory that God gets is when he makes people in his own image and his own likeness and gives them free will and gives them a rational mind, they hear a set of facts and then exercise faith that he gave them to believe. Watch this. Or not. Now, I know it sounds hard, but it's really not. I'll tell you a quick story, then I'm going to move on because I don't have all day. I knew this fella, he married this girl. And we lived in the same project. And I got up one morning and wandered over to their apartment, knocked on the door, the door was ajar. I hollered in there, hey! Didn't hear nothing. I pushed the door, came inside. And saw the husband holding down his wife on the couch. He was out of breath, she was out of breath, but he was stronger than her, so she couldn't move. 
So I called him by his name. Let's say Bob. I said, Bob, why are you holding down your wife? Because every time I turn on Lou, she leaves. I said, now, Bob, <laughs> do you really want a wife? The only way she going to stay with you. You got to hold her down. Bob, what you going to do when you get tired? <laughs> he looked at me. He turned the woman loose. You know what she did? She got up and walked out that door <laughs> and didn't come back. Now be real. Don't be so hard on God, but, but you assess. Do you really want somebody that you have to make stay with you? Or do you want someone to stay with you because they love you. Now, I looked up some scriptures that tell us the heart of God toward each and every lost person. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 7, for example, this is God's heart. Uh, and this is Paul writing to a young preacher about how God looks at lost people in his heart for them. He says, therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, that's, that's more than just regular prayer. I mean, you in there hot crying, Lord, save so-and-so. Oh, God, touch the heart. Prayers, intercessions, just different ways uh, to talk about uh, what you need to do to pray for these sinners. Just like you used to be a sinner. You, you got to pray for them and, and give thanks and for, for, for all men, for kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness uh, and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires, now listen to this, all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles, everybody that's not a Jew, in faith and truth. And then the apostle Peter picks up the theme in uh, 2 Peter 3, uh, 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 starting at verse 3, listen to this. Peter says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, the days that we're living in right now, scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that was then was overflowed with water. It perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Here it is. Listen to this. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that 
any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And what is repentance? Fancy word, metanoia, change of heart, change of mind, change of action. Stop being an unbeliever. Turn from your wicked ways and believe. So that's God's heart. He doesn't want anybody to die and go to hell. He's a merciful God, but he is a just God who must punish sin of which we're all guilty. Ain't no question, ain't no doubt about it. If you're honest, you know you are a sinner. And yes, you know what sin is. Doing something wrong and you knew it was wrong before you did it and you went ahead and did it anyway. We're guilty. And we think we can escape sin's penalty, but we can't. But one way. God, the Bible says, has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And he voluntarily died in our place, took the penalty that we deserved, took the punishment that had our name on it, and died. But death could not keep him in the ground. He got up early one Sunday morning and said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person he that believes and is baptized shall be saved and he who does not believe shall really the Greek is remain condemned because see you're not going to be condemned as an unbeliever with your one birthday having self You are already condemned. Matter of fact, you march into your funeral. And would to God, it would be over at your funeral. But it's not. The Bible warns of something in the book of Revelation that's called the second death. The lake of fire. Into which every unrepentant sinner shall be thrown. Now watch this. You don't hear this type of preaching a lot these days unless you come and hear Jason because everybody today want to talk about how good you are, what blessing is coming around the corner and this, that, and the other and, and, and look like that God is just a big old uh, over happy Santa Claus willing to just bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. And never deal with your number one problem. You are a sinner. Who needs to be saved from eternal hell. And it's a simple message. And that message alone can save you. Well, preacher. Well, preacher Kears. If it's not God's will that any should perish. If it's his will that everybody will come to repentance. Why doesn't everybody get saved? Glad you asked. Because the devil, who is real, he is a spirit, he is a liar, he is a murderer, he is a deceiver, and he works in your heart and in your mind, and his job is to deceive you, and he does it with lies. Ignore what that preacher is saying. That's not really true. Ain't no such a place as hell and that, 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 that. <laughs> but you are created in the image of God. It's tainted, but it's enough essence left over for you to be able to discern. So what you're really doing is you're making a choice. So now let's quickly go through these lies. Seven of the devil's favorite lies to keep you lost and confused. Lie number one. Y'all call it evolution. I call it evolution. <laughs> because it's evil. Two Psalms, 14, 1, 53, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now listen. You, listen, I ain't talking about you. I'm telling you what the Bible says. If you believe that all of this precision and all of this wonder and all of this majesty, which we call creation, precise and exact in its being, if you believe that all of that happened by chance, time, and matter, 
with no creator, with no designer, you need to come up here and take this mic because you have way more faith than me. You believe that everything came from nothing? I was 14 in my biology class, and the teacher went on and on and on. Back there, they called it the theory of evolution. Now they just drop the theory and just straight out lying. I'm 14. I see the sun up there. It's burning. Then I did some study. It's burning helium. I got some binoculars and a telescope. Can I tell you what I don't see? I don't see a gas pipeline running up there. <laughs> and that's just one. One star. Listen to me, burning and 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 not burning up. Oh, that happened by chance. And the earth tilted exactly by degree. Just right so as not to burn up for being too close or not to freeze for being too far same binoculars same telescope I don't see no ropes holding it in place I got on a watch uh, at one time wasn't no such a thing as a watch but in order to make something, you have to see it. Well, if it never was one and you made it, where did you see it? The Bible will tell you. By faith, we know that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which do appear were made from those things which appear not. 14. Take away everything that man made. Stuff. My experience with stuff, in order for stuff to be here, somebody had to make it. Take away all the stuff that man made on purpose for a purpose. Stuff is still here. Let's just have some fun. What is a watermelon doing here? <laughs> Evolution. Apple. Peaches. Pumpkin pie. That stuff is here on purpose for a purpose. Oh, can I, can I say this to you? Who made the mountains? Who made the trees? Who made the river flow to the sea? I don't know about you, but I've concluded there must be There got to be a God somewhere. I'm going to move on, Pastor, but I'm sitting in my living room, 14. Where did I come from? Daddy and mama. Where did they 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 come from? Daddy, daddy, mama, mama. I wish I had a praying church in here. After a while, you're going to get down to the first daddy, the first mommy. You still got a question, where did they come from? Evolutionist and orangutan. <laughs> or a baboon. Look like to me, if that was true, it will still be some monkey men, baboon men around somewhere. <laughs> Stuck, you know. We had one of them big coffee table Bibles right there on the coffee table. I got up out of my chair. I went to that Bible. I flipped it open. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. I read in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the tears began to flow down my face. And then I asked God the question that any five-year-old would ask. 
where did you come from? Not in an audible voice, but I heard him say, I am God. I've always been God. Will always be God. And I just revealed myself to you. I am God. And beside me, there is none else. Come on, help me say it. The devil is a liar. I'm not no close cousin to no chimpanzee. <laughs> Favorite line number two. You are a good person. So you don't need to be saved. Most people, if you ask them, they think they're pretty good. Because they're only willing to go, you know, on the surface. But when you dig a little deeper and you use the right standard, I already told you, if you're honest, you might be good by some standard, but let me tell you about what standard you're not good. You're not good by God's standard. The young rich ruler in Luke 18, he had it all together. He came to Jesus, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. You know the commandments? Have you kept the commandments? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not be. Oh, yes. These have I kept from my youth up. Okay. Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and follow me. The Bible says that the young man walked away sorrowful. What had Jesus done? He put his finger on that man's real God. Yes, That's all right to have money, but if your God, your money becomes your God, then you breaking the commandment. Thou shalt have. And he wanted to hold on to his God so he couldn't get Jesus and hold on to his God at the same time. What did he find out? He wasn't so good after all when he used the right standard. Are y'all in here with me? Now, let me tell you something. Same thing going to happen to you and me and anybody else if you measure yourself against the right standard. But the devil going to tell you, you're not that bad. And God gave me this little illustration. It's not going to happen like this because in hell you're going to be isolated. It's a fire that doesn't even have no light. But it's hot, though, real hot. <laughs> you just can't see nothing. You can hear everybody hollering, whoo. So this is just me using my imagination. Some of y'all good folks that think you're too good, you ain't going to hell. You, with your one birthday had himself, <laughs> going to die, go to hell, and you're going to get a seat right next to Al Capone. <laughs> Al Capone be smoking a cigar. <sighs> I murdered. I was an extortionist. What you in for? <laughs> I went to church. I sung on the choir. I helped old lady cross the street. I bought Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> I thought I was pretty good. Let me tell you something. You're not going to hell but because of an individual sin that you commit. That's just the fruit of the root. You go to hell because of who you are and what you remain. Now, just use your imagination. Why would God let your one birthday have himself in heaven knowing that you're not going to like it? And plus, the moment you get up there, you're going to do the same thing the devil did. Raise hell right in heaven. Because that's your nature. So he has to change your nature. So you will love God, love heaven, love holiness, love righteousness, love to obey God, love to live for God. Yeah. Okay. Lie number three. And this is a combination lie. You are too evil to be saved and you've been evil too long to be saved. The devil tell you, oh, what's the use? Mama was an addict, you were an addict. Oh, forget about it, man. What's the big deal? I just can't stop drinking no matter what. I've been drinking all my life. 
I try to give up these cigarettes, but I just can't. Oh, my God, man. I'm, I'm just too messed up to be saved. And look, man, I've been this way all my life. God has an anecdote for those lies. King David, a man after God's own heart, what did he do? He committed adultery. He slept with Bathsheba. Then if that wasn't bad enough, he got her pregnant, tried to cover up his dirty deed. He, 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 he plotted and had her husband Uriah murdered. God told prophet Nathan, go tell him what he had done. What did David do? He confessed. He repented. He had to pay the consequences. But let me tell you what God did. He forgave David. He forgave David. And called David a man after God's own heart. And then Manasseh. Oh, I love Manasseh. Second Chronicles chapter 33. Manasseh was the son of a good king by the name of Hezekiah. He reigned for 55 years. He was wicked for 54 of them 55 years. And I, I get tickled, y'all, when I read about Manasseh. Because the Bible says that Manasseh was so wicked, he outwickeded the wicked people that lived around him. <laughs> the Bible says that God had a list of wicked things that he told the children of Israel not to do. And I'm not making this up. This is true. So that means Manasseh sat down with the list. I'm going to try that. He went down the list of wicked things not to do, checked off everything on the list, got up and looked around. I guess I got to start my own list. And God sent prophets to warn him he wouldn't listen. Finally, God sent the Assyrians. They captured him. They took him off the throne. They put a chain in his nose. They dragged him. They threw him in a dungeon. Down in the dungeon, wicked King Manasseh, wicked for 54 out of 55 years, repented. And the Bible says, and the Lord heard him and forgave him. Favorite lie? <laughs> Number four, favorite line number four, you are too young to get saved. Have some fun, child. You got plenty of time to get saved. That's for old people. Only problem is you don't know if you're going to live to get old. Don't believe me? Take a walk in the cemetery. There's some graves in there from infant on up. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. The devil want to try to make you believe you're missing so much fun. What fun? Getting drunk, getting herpes, help me, Jesus. <laughs> he going to tell you how much fun it is to get with that girl, to get with that boy, until your check, which was this big, now it's that big because you got child See, you think God trying to keep something from you when he's trying to keep you from headache and heartache and disappointment. And if you did it for God and if you got saved while you were young, you would see what the psalmist found out. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. In 2 Chronicles 34, Josiah became king at the age of eight. At the age of 16, he led a corrupt nation to revival. And over in Welsh, uh, Evan Roberts, at the age of 13, gave his life to Christ. At the age of 25, he fasted and prayed and asked God to save 100,000 people on the day that the Welsh version of our Super Bowl was to be played. So many people got saved. Until the stadium stood empty, but the churches stood full because a young person gave his life to Christ. Young people, stop letting the devil fool you. Don't get out here and get confused in your lostness. Listen, 
I'm not politically correct, don't care, don't try to be. I'm biblically correct. I ain't calling one person they. I'm not calling a man she. I'm not calling a woman he. Well, don't you respect them? Don't you respect me? I ain't going to deny reality for you. That ain't helping you. You are deceived. And somebody needs to tell you. Not according to my standard, but I believe the Bible. And the Bible don't mention nothing about no 87 genders. The Bible says he made male and female. And I might get in trouble for it. I might get this and that for it. But let me tell you something. I don't care. You don't need a surgeon's knife. You don't need gender altering drugs. You need a new birth. You need to repent. You need to be born again. Yeah. Well, you don't understand, Pastor Kears. I was born that way. I do understand. That's why I'm telling you, even though you was born that way, messed up, just like the rest of us, you messed up in some way. But watch this. Just because you was born that way, you don't have to stay that way. Oh, you must be. You got to be born again. Well, how can I be born again? Agree with God. Repent and turn from your wicked ways. And say, God, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. I'm weak, oh God, but thou art mighty. Change me. Strengthen me, God. And I'm a living witness. He'll change you. Your sin won my proclivity, but let me tell you something, I had my proclivities. Yeah, man. And I ain't proud of it, but I'm just letting you know. But I got born again. Do I have a witness in here? So don't believe that lie. Amen? Number five. And this is, oh, he loved this whopper right here. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere because there is only one God and all religions are basically the same. I put Acts chapter 4, 7 through 12 on the screen. Now remember now, pastor ain't up here arguing with you. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm the one with the advantage around here. You the one to either believe it or not. And that's not said from meanness or in insincerity or dispassion. No, no. I'm saying it in love. Listen to me. You can believe Oprah and Chopra and Okra all you want. You can hitch your wagon to whoever you want. But I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I'm going to serve the one who bled, suffered, and died and rose from the dead for me. Now these preachers had got arrested for preaching and they had told them uh, to hush. And they had them before the council. Just like Jesus said that they would. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked by what power or by what name have you done this? A man was healed. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, you shall receive power. You can't do this in your own strength just like I can. But you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. He said to them, you rulers of the people. Big shot, little shot, no shot. I'm going to tell all y'all the same thing. Rulers of the people, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you hold. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John 14, 6 on the screen. And I'm almost finished. John 14, 6 on the screen. This is Jesus. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Ain't but one way to be saved. Come to Jesus. And don't you be deceived. I'm back to the young folks now. And some of you old ones too. <laughs> don't you be deceived by all these folks running around here talking about, well, that's not my truth. Yeah, that's your truth. I got my own truth. Well, let's just you get your butt up here on this 10-story building and jump down. And let's see how you violate that truth of gravity. You're going to bust wide open down on the ground. Where well, fire is hot. Where well, fire is not hot. That's not my truth. <laughs> Physical law ordained by God has immediate consequences. So people ain't running around here talking about that's my truth when it comes to jumping down off that 10-story building. But God's spiritual law has a consequence. It's just not immediate. And the Bible says, because judgment is not speedily executed, the heart of man is fully set to do evil. And they mistake God's mercy that he's not going to do nothing. And I read it to you earlier. The reason he doesn't execute his judgment on you right then, he's giving you mercy. But you're wasting his mercy. And one day his mercy is going to run out. And you're going to see that you jumped off that 10-story building and didn't have no parachute. And on the way down, too late to turn around. You're going to bust wide open on the ground because you done let the devil lie to you. That it's a difference between God's natural law and God's spiritual law. And it's not. The only difference is when God executes the consequences of violating his law. <clears throat> Number six. The Bible is not the word of God. It was written by white people to keep the black man down. And hey, what about the lost books of the Bible? You have more obeyed the found books and they're worried about the lost books. You <laughs> <laughs> worried about the lost books of the Bible? Help me, Holy Ghost. And then look, the Bible is full of myths and contradictions. The Bible is irrelevant for modern society and does not apply to people today. You know what I know about people who say that kind of stuff? They haven't read the Bible. And if they did, they read it with blinders on with their one birth they had himself so they couldn't understand it because they couldn't see the kingdom of heaven because they wouldn't believe. They would not believe. Now, you know, my wife pointed out to me, all these people running around here, the white man wrote that Bible so the slaves would be obedient. Them some mighty white folks. Because when the Bible was written, America hadn't even been discovered. Wasn't no America. Well, let me see. Many thousands of years from now, it's going to be America. So we got to write this book to keep the slaves in line. And slavery was like a job back then when this was written. The master was like the boss, the owner. 
the slave worked and earned a living. And all of that is nothing but a smoke screen to keep you from doing the one thing you need to do in order to be saved. Repent and be lead. Okay. Last but not least, number seven, devil's favorite lies. There is no such a place as hell. Why would a loving God Send people to hell. I wouldn't send my child there. So why would God do that? I can't imagine that God would be that cruel. Oh, but there's a heaven. And the devil has deceived you into thinking that the so-called worst of the worst, the only ones that go to hell, but not me. Why would I go to hell? Why would God send me to hell? The truth of the matter is, he's not sending anybody to hell. People go to hell because they are choosing to go to hell. How so? If I warn you that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I let you live. I could have let you die in your sin right today. But I let your life roll on and granted you grace after grace, mercy after mercy, warning after warning. And I ain't got time to answer all the whatabouts. So I'll just say this. You are already receiving way more than you deserve. I'm going to conclude with this true story. I was trying to get rid of a wrecked car. And I prayed about it. I said, Lord, I want at least $300 for this wrecked car. Now, you had to be looking for my house. You just don't go come by my house on an accident. The doorbell rang. Man standing on the front porch with a tow truck. How may I help you? You trying to sell this wrecked car? Yes, I'm trying to sell this wrecked car. What brings you here? I, I'd like to buy it. How much you want for it? $300. You got it. I'm going to pay you in cash. Then the man began to tell me some of his story. I guess he saw that maybe I believed in God or something. I hadn't said it. So he started spilling his beans. And he started complaining about how his wife cheated on him. Left him after eight years. How his dog bit him and the cat left him. <laughs> how he was such a good fella. Why is all of this stuff happening to such a good guy as me? I looked at him. I said, you, 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 you thinking the wrong way. He said, how you know what I'm thinking? I said, I can piece up what you're thinking by what you're saying. He said, well, what I'm thinking? You thinking, why does God let so many bad things? happen to such a good guy as you. How did you know that? I said because most people think like that. And you'll never get anywhere with God thinking like that. Let me see, can I help you? Here's what you should be thinking. Why does anything good ever happen to such a bad fella as me? Now you talking about all the bad stuff. Let me tell you some of the good stuff you overlook. God let your sorry behind live. You and I both know you ain't all that good. You a sinner and you know it. You know that you've done stuff. You know that you do stuff. You standing up here right now lying to me about how good you are. No, no, no. Don't be up here talking about why does God let so many bad things happen to such a good person as me. 
You ain't going to come near of seeing how it really is until you flip that. Why does anything good ever happen to somebody as bad as me? I said, let me tell you some good stuff that happened to you. God let you wake up this morning. How old are you? 35. You could have been dead and already in hell right now. But he kept you out of hell. That's grace and mercy. And see, that's what's wrong with most arrogant Americans. Strutting their way to hell. So good. By what standard? When I told him that, y'all, it was like I pulled out some ether and put it to his nose. Confronted him with his sin. That's what love does. Don't let you walk around deluded. You're not good. You need a savior. Thank God one is available. His name is Jesus. Yeah, he's the bright and the morning star. He's the lily of the valley. He alone is good. And he loved you so much that he came and died a horrible death in your place. And all he asks you to do is repent and believe. Now, I told you before I started what I was up to. I showed all my cards. I'm fishing. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Well, that's what I've been doing. I'm fishing. Let me tell you what I learned a long time ago. I learned I can't save anybody. All I can do is plant and water the word of God. God gives the increase. Well, how does he give the increase? Every time a sinner confesses and admits, I am a sinner, I can't save myself. I can't figure it out. I can't work it out. I can't change it out. The only way I can get out is to believe out. So here's an invitation. If you want to get into the two birthday crowd, it's so easy. Lay down your pride. Tell the devil, Get behind me, Satan. I'm going to stop being an unbeliever. And I'm going to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God has raised him from the dead. And he promised if I do that, if I trust him, he would save me. I believe it. And you, sir, you, ma'am, you, young person, you will be saved. If not, you won't. It's just that simple. So, if you want to be saved today, all you have to do is lift up your hand. And by lifting it up, you'll be telling me, you'll be saying, Preacher, I'm not saved. I want to be saved. I, I want to believe. Help my unbelief. Raise your hand up. And say, preacher, I, I, I believe. I, I want to be saved. Is there anybody here today that wants to believe? Just raise your hand. Do I see any hands raised? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'll make the appeal again. Nobody's watching you but me and God. If you want to be saved today, just lift your hand up and say, Preacher, I want to be saved. I want to have two birthdays. I want God to be my dad. I need to be born again. Well, the old preachers used to say, I have done 
as the Lord has commanded me to do. And yet there is room. And if Israel is not saved, Jacob shall not lose his reward. Thank you for hearing the gospel today. I hope that someday you will believe. Come on, somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on, if you're here this morning. Come on, and you're grateful for the word of the Lord. Come on, and it's come to your understanding. Somebody give the Lord. I'll just give you five more seconds. I tell you, because praise is contagious. Just five more seconds. If you're grateful for his faithfulness, his grace, and his mercy in your life. We're going to move. We're going to move. Um, I do invite you all, every single one of you, you have to go grab your child from Sunday school, grab your child from Sunday school, then come right back down, because I can't wait to tell you what God is doing internationally through CLTR Global. But before then, I just want to pray for you. Can I pray for you real quick? With every head bowed and every eye closed. I can't help but think that this whole day was mapped out for some of you for this moment. And I want to give you one more opportunity and one more chance because I love you that much and because the Lord loves you that much. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you don't know if you die today, if you would go to heaven or hell, but you want to be sure and you want to accept Jesus and the love that he has for you in your life. Whether you know it or not, your grandmother prayed, your grandfather prayed for this moment. Someone in your lineage has been praying for this very moment that when you die, you would walk and bask in the glory of God forever. And so all of those prayers culminate in a moment like this. Now that you've heard the gospel, every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's even just one that says, I don't know, Pastor Jason, if I died, if I go to hell, but I want to be sure today, and I know the only way is through Jesus. If that's you, just lift your hand. Even if there's one, we just want to celebrate you. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to make you do anything. We just want to pray for you. If there's one, hallelujah, there's one. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. There's two. There's two. Hallelujah. Come on, don't wait. Don't wait. Don't think about it. If that's you, lift that hand high. Join the two that have said yes, Lord. Come on, if that's you, raise. There's three. Thank you, Jesus. There's three. Come on, there's more. There may be more. Don't wait. Don't wait. Lift that hand nice and high and say, Pastor, wait for me. Don't close in prayer yet. I want to accept two. Come on, lift that hand high if that's you. Lift it high if that's you. Come on, keep praising, church. God is moving. God is moving. You don't know how long you may live. It might be an accident. It might be a sickness. You might lose your ability to speak. Whatever the case, don't wait another moment. There's room for you in heaven. Come on, give it another moment. If that's you, just say, Pastor, just wait. All you want to do is pray for me. All I got to do is pray. Hallelujah. I, I, I want that. I want that opportunity. If that's you, lift those hands high. 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 I give you another moment, just one more moment, and we're gonna move. If that's you, come. If that's you, come. If that's you, lift those hands high. Going. Going. Gone. Let's pray. Stretch our hands to those who have come here to this altar. And because none of us are perfect, we're gonna pray this prayer all together with our sisters who have come. And if I'm praying and you're still there, come on and just, you're not interrupting anything. You just come right up on here and, and join if that's you. Come on, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this moment, for this precious opportunity that I have had to receive your truth. I receive your truth today. Lord, I realize I've lived life as an imperfect person 
as a sinner. And Lord, I realize I can't save myself, but by the redeeming blood of Jesus, I am cleansed, I am washed of all of my sin. And so Lord, I take advantage of this moment and I run from my wicked ways and I run to your righteous outstretched hand. Lord, wash me, cleanse me, make me clean as freshly fallen snow. Change me forever. Lord, I believe that you suffered, that you died and were buried. And on the third day, you rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. And you ascended into heaven. And you gave me the gift of your Holy Spirit to lead me, to guide me, to change me, to empower me. I receive that gift. Lord, on this day, you are mine. And finally, I am yours. Come on, somebody give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Come on, our sisters, our new sisters in the Lord. Hell just lost two. Thank you, Jesus. Hell just lost two. Thank you, Lord.